David Dykes is a teacher from Tennessee who teaches right here in San Miguel. He has an MFA in poetry from Texas State University. He has lived in San Miguel off and on since 1986. He is part of the podcast Atticus Shrugged about Southern culture and politics. Please welcome the man who put the word tall into tall tales, my friend David Dykes. Um, I, I lost most of this story on the way here, so bear with me if I have to reach around and find it. But uh, like Denty said, I'm from East Tennessee, redneck country, and I came down about 1986 and I wanted to come to a place where there were a lot of artists and there were two working art schools here back then and um, things were a little bit different. There were no gated communities, no Starbucks. We kind of lived like cavemen. <laughs> but there were a lot of artists and I got to know artists and I really liked artists I discovered because, well, I'd always wanted to kind of be an artist and I was a redneck and I got here and found out there was a lot of overlap that, uh, well, it's, it's um, they're both groups of people with very idiosyncratic ways of looking at the world and who refuse to give over those idiosyncratic views to the, the broad middle. And uh, so I sort of moved into this uh, place in the Venn diagram where there's overlap between redneck and artist, not completely either one, I guess. And I've been living there and here uh, off and on for the rest of my uh, life, I guess. Uh, anyway, so I got to know a lot of artists when I came here. And one of my favorite people that I met all my time in San Miguel was a guy named Lee Allen. And Lee Allen was always telling stories. He was a southerner. He was from Mobile, if I remember right, he was from Mobile, Alabama. And he, um, he was gay, and I guess that's another circle on the Venn diagram. I'm in that circle, too. And so when you get all three of those things together, the space gets very small. And so I, I really enjoyed spending time with Lee and listening to Lee's stories. And he had a million great stories because he'd done a million things in his life. He'd been a drag queen on Bourbon Street. He had been uh, much less savory things on Bourbon Street, I believe. Um, he had run a freak show for a while. He'd been a nurse. Uh, he was in the Army briefly. At the very beginning of World War II, he had volunteered like um, uh, patriotic young men did then, I guess. And, uh, but he said to me, my mother carried me for nine months. And I figured I couldn't expect the Army to do any more. And um, I, I don't know what sort of discharge he had, whether it was honorable or dishonorable. Uh, dishonorable discharge might be a good name for his story of being in the Army. But uh, <laughs> he, um, I, I, came up with, I came up with names for all the stories that he would tell me, and he told a lot of great ones. There was one that I call 17 Sailors Looking for Miss Dixie. And um, there's one, uh, well, the one that I'm going to tell you is called The Half and Half. And it's about when he was working in the freak show. He was working as a half and half, which I didn't really know what he was talking about. And he had a boyfriend who he told me was uh, the most beautiful man that ever lived. His name was Howard. And Howard would do the ballet the ballyhoo out on the midway and he would stand out there and he wore the campiest little thing it was a it was a tuxedo that was all covered with sequins and he was so beautiful he would always get so many people in off of the midway and i would be inside doing the half and half now you probably haven't spent a lot of time in the carnival and i said no lee i, I really haven't and he said well if the half and half i was half man half woman i was leela and the way that you do the half and half is, you've got this little clip. Uh, yes, <laughs> a little clip, and half of it goes right up your ass, and the other makes a line right under your balls, and it makes a little indentation there, and you get a bit of ladies' lipstick, 
and you run it right along that crease and, well, people see what they want to see. And I was like, well, that sounds, yeah, great, Lee. <laughs> and um, so he goes on. He's talking about Howard is out there, and he's calling him in. He's calling him in. He gets the entire bullpen full. That's about 40 people. And it's the middle of the day, so it's a good crowd. And he takes the money that we're paying two bits each. That was $10. This was in 1940s. $10 was a lot of money back then. And they all come in because in the 1940s, you didn't see a lot of naked people and they were getting two for one. <laughs> How, Howard is out there and he's saying, ladies and gentlemen, this is God's mistake. This is nature's freak. Come on in. No one under 18 allowed. Come on in. And so they, they all come in and I'm standing up on the stage and the crowd gathers and they fill up the tent. And there's this one broad down front, and she's kind of mouthy from the very beginning. And I could tell she'd had a little something to drink, and she was very skeptical, and she's sort of trying to spread that around. But I started into my routine where I said, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that I am not here to be laughed at. I am not here as a so-called freak. I am here for science because I want you to understand what people like me go through and what our lives are like. And I want you to be a little bit more compassionate towards everyone when you see what I, what I truly am. And I was wearing, well, I have the campiest little old thing too. It was on the top, one half was a lady's dress. The other half was a gentleman's suit. And down below, just a skirt with nothing on underneath it, of course, because, well, so I, I start, I, I finish up my little spiel, and I come up towards the front, and I lift up my skirt, and all my junk's hanging down there, and everybody kind of leans in. And so I lift up my junk, and this woman down front, she says, bullshit. <laughs> I ignored her, and I say, if you look very closely, you will see, and she says, bullshit. And I said, excuse me, but I am absolutely honest in everything that I say here before you tonight. And this lady, and she says, shouts up from down below, she says, I will have you all know that I am a pediatric nurse and I have delivered over 1,500 babies and I can tell you that no child is ever born with a complete and separate set of both male and female organs. Well, the crowd started to turn on me a little bit then, and I thought, you know, this could turn nasty. They could all come up and demand their money back. I mean, this was in 1940s. $10 was a lot of money back then. And so I thought on my feet and I said, if everyone will please leave the tent, I will allow this nurse to give me a full physiological examination. And everybody seems a little confused. They stand, they look at each other. And I say, go on now. And so out they went. They went back out into the bullpen and big nurse comes up and she gets right down on the edge of the stage and I come and I sit down next to her and I say, madam, I will have you know that I too have been a nurse. I worked at Mobile General Hospital under Nurse McClatchy, who you might know. I worked at Forest County Hospital. I worked at Charity Hospital in New Orleans. And I believe that professional courtesy <laughs> requires that you tell those people that I am just what I say I am. She just sort of goes, hmm, and she walks out. Well, I wasn't about ready to give up that money, so I go right out under the skirts at the back of the tent, and I circle around to see what's going on. Well, whoop. well, <laughs> by the time I get all the way around the tent, Big Nurse has climbed up onto the box with Howard, and I can see that he's having none of it. He's standing back. And she looks out at the crowd, and she says, in all my years as a nurse, 
I will tell you, I have seen a lot, but this is the first time I have ever seen a completely formed set of both male and female genitals on the same individual. I saw Howard look relieved. I don't know what my face looked like, but I was probably very relieved too. And you know, I wonder why I never worked that into the act. <laughs> you know, I probably should have, because you know, there's nothing in the world like expert testimony to convince people that you are exactly what you say you are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.